Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. All right, so <clears throat> New Year's Eve wines. Um, and I, I, I busted some out. Now, I've been buying these sparkling wines for a little while over the past year or so. Actually, one of these might have been, I might have had longer than a year or bought it over a year ago. Um, anyway, so I've got <clears throat> three different sparkling wines um, from three different sources. And, um, and one of them was a, was a free sample. And uh, I'm excited to try them out, man. Like, you know, I, yeah. And I've been actually collecting some sparkling wines. I went to a, a High Street, the the wine bar I like to go to. Uh, they had a uh, they had a sparkling wine around the world uh, class, and they had six different sparkling wines from all over the place. And I bought all six. I don't know why. I mean, they're all good. I think I bought them just for the. Some of it was like novelty factor. Um, you know, Hungarian sparkling wine. What? Yeah. Um, anyway, so. So I got a whole bunch of sparkling wine to drink besides these. Anyway, um, so let's get right into it. I'm real excited to try these. Um, so the first one, the first one is the non-vintage Maison Albert Bichot Cremant de Bourgogne Brut Reserve. Uh, I got this as one of those underground seller deals at $29. That was the initial... Um, I don't see if the little tab was in there, but um, that was the initial... Uh, or that was the... Um, the uh, the entry level price, and this was the wine that you got. This was the twenty nine dollar wine, um, so I didn't get like a deal on this one. Um, anyway, you know, I'm opening it up properly. Use the use the blade on your on your knife to get the foil off. Because if there is a tab, I couldn't find it, and even then, we're not supposed to use a tab. I'm all pretty and stuff. Anyway, um, so Albert Bichot, let's, let's switch over to that, my little notes here. No, not that. So uh, let's, let's get back to the little history thing. Anyway, so <clears throat> they were founded in 1831, but their family, uh, the first traces of the Bichot family date back to 1214. So, wow. Uh, they settled in Burgundy in 1350. Um, and this is in their fief of Chateauneuf on Auxois. Okay? Which I actually, not really exactly sure where that is. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. The family's coat of arms has not changed since, nor has its symbol a doe, which is Bichet, I guess. Um, in 1831, Bernard Bichot founded a wine trading business in his name, um, and then his son Hippolyte, 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 uh, succeeded him and brought, uh, the first vines into Volnay, already conceived, or already convinced that upstream control was essential. And then his son, his son, Albert, was the first to bear the name, uh, and gave the family business new momentum in the late 19th century and settled in the center of bone uh, once and for all 1912 anyway and then it goes on from there so this wine oh it smells so good so a Cremant de Bourgogne so it's a sparkling wine from Burgundy um, the variety of grapes and the choice of the origins are a result of oh, sorry, the Chardonnay uh, Pinot Noir because those are basically the two grapes of Burgundy um, let's see I was going to see if there's anything else on here that's 60% Chardonnay, 40% Pinot Noir. Uh, origins mainly in Auxerrois and the Mackinac, that's for the Chardonnay, and the Cote Chalonnay 
for the Pinot Noir. Uh, reserve wines are 10 to 15% of the uh, blend. So non-vintage just means, you know, they usually come from different vintages. Um, it gives you like a kind of an evening effect, um, gives you a being some credit house style. So you have consistency from year to year when you release it. And reserve wines are the wines that they hold back um, to, to um, make the blends, make the base wines. Um, aging eight to nine months uh, for the base wine in thermo, th oh, thermo, I don't know why I had a hard time, thermoregulated uh, stainless steel vats. Each grape variety is vinified separately so uh, as to obtain the best expression of its origin. And then aging uh, on the lees, 12 months at least, three additional months after disgorgement before it is ready. And they have a dosage of seven to eight grams per liter, so it's considered dry um, or like extra brute. No, brute. Yeah. Anyway. So, I mean, it's got the typical champagne uh, aromas. It's got that baked goods, that brioche, that, you know, um, almost, uh, almost like, uh, you know, pastry type of stuff. It's really good. Um, we're going to swirl that. I'm going to get some aeration into there. Yeah, I mean, it, it really leads with all that bakery type stuff. A touch of a green apple. A um, little apple blossom. Very faint, though. Yeah, it's almost like a little bit of cinnamon. Like, um, um, if you're from this area of the country that I'm from, uh, or pretty much anywhere that has um, a large uh, Mexican population, churros. So you've got, the, it's, a bake, it's a baked good, it's cinnamon. They're tasty, I mean, they're really tasty. I'm not saying you can't have churros in like Chicago or North Dakota, but it's more prevalent in this type of, in this part of the country. Um, so it's got a little bit of that, almost like a churro, churro. Uh, quality. So like a touch of cinnamon. I, oh, I can't wait to taste this thing. So that green apple really comes through now, um, along with all the big, big goods type of stuff. Um, there's even a touch of orange to it that's not present on the, on the, on the uh, nose. Got really got a mouthfeel, um, <clears throat> the mousse, the bubbles. Um, even though it's in this type of glass, you still get that interaction with your mouth. The acid is really high. Um, as I discussed, the only reason to have these is for the pretty, for the pretty bubbles. You can't really, can't really get the aromatics out of those things. I mean, you can, but not as much as you can have a regular glass. Don't worry, I'm going to use it later. There's even, there's even a little bit of like a peach, a peach Bellini type of thing. Um, a touch of orange, the green apple, all that kind of stuff. It's really tasty. Oh, I forgot to tell you how much, how much oh yeah, I told you, $29. So yeah, really nice. So let's close all those. Now we're not doing that one next. All right, so the next one we're going to do I'm really excited about doing this one. So let's let's get that let's get that puppy back on there. There we go. Uh, this next one is the non-vintage Bruno Payard Champagne Extra Brut Premier Cuvée. Uh, this was a free sample um, <clears throat> that I got from my friends at Creative Palette. It retails for about fifty bucks. Okay, so. By no means is this cheap. Um, so, I thought I had, I thought I had the docs already pulled up. So let me pull that up real quick. Bam, Bruno Payard. 
Anyway. Do some opening. So, Bruno Parnari is not a businessman who created a champagne house. He's a man who created a house to make champagne he loves. Um, uh, he is, Bruno Parnari is part of his champagne's DNA, uh, creating a highly personal expression. Uh, he makes the blends, nosing, and tasting over, over new 250 base wines, each vintage. Uh, his daughter... Alice, who now shares in the decision-making process, uh, says he has an excellent nose. Uh, they've been growing uh, champagne grapes in the two Grand Cru villages of Bouzy and Verzenay since 1704. His great-grandfather was a vineyard manager. Uh, his father, Remy, had a small parcel of vines and owned a grape brokering company. This really doesn't want to pop open, does it? Okay, so we're going to cage off when you're not supposed to do so I'm trying to get a better grip on this um yeah this thing does not want to come off in service this is not the type of court you want to have this is not the type of problem you want to have because you don't know how this is going to pop off oh man it's really not coming off All right, uh, anyway, as I try to keep going, at uh, age 21, he began to work alongside his father. It wasn't long before um, he, uh, a, a restless, energetic type started to try, uh, though ultimately failed to convince his father to establish his own champagne house. So, um, so in 1981, at age 27, he decided to do it. He sold a uh, Mark II Jaguar for 50,000 francs, borrowed money from the bank, bought grapes, and began making his own champagne in a rented space. Um, oh my God, this thing is not coming off. Uh, his father's concern was not misplaced. It was a tough time in champagne. Big champagne houses, increasingly owned by multinationals, were pushing out traditional small family businesses. But on the plus side, Payard, with six years of grape growing, broke, grape broking. Brokering, I think it was a great brokering experience, knew where the group, where good grapes were to be found, and he was also very good at working with others, which is crucial in champagne, where business is founded on long-term relationships, blah, 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 blah. All right, so, uh, so 81, he founded the uh, Champagne House. Uh, first Champagne House to print disgorgement dates on the bottle was 1985 by them. Groundbreaking, uh, 1990, groundbreaking for a new winery in 1990. In 94, purchase of the first vineyard, 7.5 acres in Ogre, or probably Auger, uh, a beautiful Grand Cru in the Côte de Blancs. So he says he looks for interesting places where he can work with a particular minerality of chalk subsoils. His wines are not stored in traditional underground cellar, burrowed out of the famous chalk soils. Instead, in 94, he introduced the first totally ground level champagne cellar. A whole bunch of stuff there. So let's let's get the info on this particular wine. As I struggle to open it, man. Uh, I've never. Here we go. There we go. All right. Finally. I've never had a bottle of sparkling wine of any sort take that long to open up. So. Let's see here. What did I just open up? Okay. So, uh, for the Premier Cuvée, it uh, says it's the flag, they say it's the flagship of their house. Uh, must be of the very best quality and much more. Uh, so, the, the Premier Cuvée must be of the very best, very best quality and much more difficult, must remain true to itself in uh, good and bad years, um, which is this type of stuff is non vintage. So, that, again, I talked about. If with the non-vintage, you're trying to keep a certain house style and you're, you're hedging your bets because there's good years and bad years, especially in a place like Champagne. Um, so you try, to, you try to even all that out. Um, so exclusive use of the wine from the first pressing is the purest. A selection of 32 villages are vinified separately in stainless steel or barrel, offering a choice that uh, allows the composition of a judicious blend consistent throughout the years. Subtle balance of grapes in the blend. It's 22% Pinot Meunier, 33% Chardonnay, and 45% Pinot Noir. 
Um, they use a minimum of 25% and up to 48% of reserve wines. So those are the ones they hold back to create to help create blends. Uh, they're aged on the leaves for at least three years and at least the double, which is uh, at least a double of the um, legally required minimum period. And then extra, extra maturation for a minimum of three months in the cellar after disgorgement, the date of which is written on the back label. So let's look for that. Uh, January 2018 is the disgorgement, which is, see, you can't see it on the back label, but it's all like dark and black except for January 2018 is in white with like super tiny print that I'm surprised I can read. Um, <clears throat> all their champagnes uh, have a very low dosage, about six grams per liter. Um, so uh, our brute is, as the word describes... Uh, not ex not an extra dry. So let's see here. Um, the rest is stuff that I don't need to read. Anyway, so let's check it out. Okay, like, you know how I like this one with all that? But you can tell the difference between a cremant of any sort and champagne. It's It's got that extra bit of bakery quality. And even the bubbles, it's still bubbling Whereas the cremant didn't really bubble a lot after in this glass. I mean, it's it's still, and when I when I swirl it, it's it, it's activating those bubbles, right? I mean, you it really gets up into your nose, like the, you, the, you can smell or you can feel the carbonation really, you know, the CO two really getting up into your nose. So similar tasting notes: orange, green apple. Um, I, I would even say pear, um, like, um, <clears throat> like fruit filled pastries, you know, um, not, not jelly donut type quality, but like, you know, those Danishes, like a Danish. So you got like, you know, uh, an apple Danish, uh, 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 tangerine or peach Danish. And I wouldn't necessarily say like a, um, you know, even even almost like a cream cheese. So that type of stuff. You know, very bready. Bread, not brett, because that'd be bad in champagne. We don't want Brettanomyces. Um, bit of floral to it, white flowers. Man, I cannot wait to try this thing. Mm. So I talked about the mousse of the Cremant. This is really just coats. Like you really feel it just when you swirl it around. The, the, the bubbles are just like filling your mouth. And everything I described from the nose is all present in the, in the mouth and in, in, in the palate. Um, it's a really good balance. Even though it's dry, <clears throat> you feel like there's a, you feel like those bakeries, those pastries, uh, that there's the sweetness there, but it's not actually sweet. You just taste that, that, that type of flavor profile, right? You know, those danishes with maybe like, <clears throat> maybe like, you know, glazing, like a, you know, like a, you know, white glaze on them. Um, and you heated it up in the oven, you know, it, it's like that fresh, that fresh type of quality to it. Um, like a warm Danish, you know, I think that's a great description. Um, you know, with the apple and uh, a touch of cinnamon and the, the, the peach and, and the orange and that type of stuff. It's a shame to be spitting all this, but I got like seven more wines to do. Outstanding wine. Outstanding wine. 50 bucks. I mean, you're going to spend a little bit of money, but it's absolutely worth it. Man, I want to drink all these wines. I want to drink all the wines. All right. <clears throat> so now let's move on to the next wine here. Let's 
reduce that. All right, so the next wine, wine number three, this is the 2009 uh, Leclerc Briand Mills, oh man, Mills, 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 Mills Me, I think that's how it's pronounced, uh, Extra Brut. Uh, I got this from Psalm Select uh, at 84 bucks. Again, not a cheap wine by any means, but if you're doing New Year's Eve and you maybe you have like, maybe, maybe you're doing a quiet New Year's Eve with your special someone and you want to splurge, you know, 50 bucks or $84, you know, these, these are, these are the types of wines that you can do that. This is not, you're going to, you're going to have a party with a whole bunch of people and uh, you're going to be dropping a lot of money because you're going to need, you know, multiple bottles of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, uh, you know, maybe you have a small party, you know, a few close friends come over type of thing, or, you know, you just want to, you know, you, or maybe not New Year's Eve, maybe it's just a regular old gathering. So anyway, um, so I'm just going to read the notes from, from Psalm Select. Uh, so today's offer deserves a standing ovation for a number of reasons. It's the last vintage created, crafted by one of Champagne's earliest adopters of organic or biodynamic farming. Uh, as a paragon of balance and terroir expression while staying uh, well under $100. It says, and to date is among the finest 09 Champagnes that uh, uh, Ian Cobble, who runs some like you founded it, has tasted. Um, I could have chosen an 08, which is considered a really like great year. Um, and it was actually cheaper, but I like the story on this one a little bit better. They're both good stories, and they're both from Psalm Select. Um, <clears throat> so let's kind of run through the story real quick. Um, so th this house exploded on the scene during the modern era thanks to the late Pascal Leclerc Briand, uh, one of the original pioneers of biodynamics and site-specific wines. Um, let's see here. Uh, Ian Cobble says he has yet to find an 09 champagne with more detailed symmetry at such a modest price. Um, let's see here. The, this artisanal champagne house first began with Lucien Leclerc uh, in 1872, the first of a few successive generations of vignerons before uh, it was shaped into a functioning production house in 1955 by his great grandson, by Lucien's. Uh, Bert, Bertrand Leclerc and his wife Jacqueline Briand, um, and it was that year that they that they decided to combine their names, um, and they moved into a place in Epernay. Uh, Bertrand's son Pascal spent decades learning his father's organic methods, and uh, upon assuming control, began a massive push towards complete organic and biodynamic conversion. Um, so. Uh, and he said uh, he was no stranger to the spotlight. And so they kind of go through some of that. Um, he passed away abruptly in 2010, making today's wine the last vintage he had his hands on. And after a nightmare spouts between his inheritors, the house and property was sold. Um, and is now under new ownership and managed by Frederic uh, Zimet, or Zimet. Um, and he says that the house hasn't lost an ounce of the natural philosophies that originally brought it to international acclaim. So Frederic um, is, has worked tirelessly to return Leclerc Briand's vineyard ownership back to where it was during Pascal's heyday, all while farming each newly acquired parcel biodynamically. Um, let's see, Champagne pundit Peter Lean gives Hervé, oh, so uh, in the, in the um, uh, he hired Hervé Justin as the, he was the former cellar master at Duval Le Roy, Le Roy, or Leroy, um, as we would say in the United States, a highly respected house that was the very first to release a certified organic champagne. Uh, Peter Lean, who's a champagne writer, gives Hervé a high praise in his newest book, um, which you should read. Um, and it says, it isn't, easy, it isn't easy to describe the brilliance of uh, Heve Justin, or to explain why he is one of Champagne's best winemakers. His wines are unlike anything else being made in Champagne, and they represent an important evolution of the region's organic and biodynamic movement. Um, it's made up of 40% Pinot Noir, 40% Chardonnay, and 20% Meunier. Um, also known as Pinot Meunier. Meunier is kind of the new way to call it because I guess it's, you know, like something about the Pinot grape and all that. Uh, anyway, let's check it out. 
even more than this. Rich golden color too. I mean, it's, it, is, it is like pure bakery, okay? And while this one had more, more of a Danish, this has more of a <sighs> croissant type of thing. You know, a flaky pastry to it. I mean, the bubbles are great in there. The green apple is there. Not so much on the other, maybe more of a peach. Not really the orange. Mm. It is outstanding. These friends are coming in town. They're going to get spoiled. I also call it Life with Mark. So if you ever follow me on Instagram and I put that hashtag in there, which I do every once in a while when I'm like, I don't say balling out, but I'm you know having some special wines or special experience. Um, yeah. So on the palate, again, that, that pastry, the Danish is there a little bit now on, on the palate. Um, again, it's not a sweet wine, but you feel like you're, you're tasting that, 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 um, that, um, glaze, you know, on the donut, uh, on, on the, the white, the white glaze on the Danish. Um, it's not as fruit forward as, as on the Payard. Um, but, um, and there's, there's actually a touch of savory to it. Just a touch, like on the back end, like, you know, as, as it kind of sits in the palate. Um, almost, um, almost like a salty, briny thing, not, you know, just like a touch, <clears throat> you know, orange is in there right now. Mm. This is by far the best of the three. And, and this was no slouch, by the way, twenty nine dollars. I mean, it's not, it's not. Also, it's not terribly expensive, but it's not like it's not it's not fifteen dollar prosecco. But and yeah, prosecco is really good too. Um, this is no slouch, but I mean, you got it. You got to give credit where credit's due, right? The mouthfeel, everything is just so elegant. It's 84 bucks, okay? In a restaurant wine list, it would be easily $170, $200. So, I mean, you're kind of, you're kind of getting up there. It's really nice. Really nice. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. So that I don't get anyone complaining I don't use a champagne flute. Oh, look at that. I'm drinking this glass. Anyway, click the links above to friend me up. Click the links below to find out more about these wines. And um, by the way, I did email Corvin in between last week's episode and this week's episode. Um, so hopefully they, they've replied by now. By the time this episode comes out and they, I, they give me a deal. Um, Click the links below to uh, frame me up. Uh, don't forget my uh, promo code with uh, Underground Seller, 1337WINE. Um, gets me a little extra. Maybe gets you a little extra. It doesn't get you a little extra, but you, know, you get to enjoy it. But I get maybe a little extra maybe to, to buy some wine. Uh, or you can hit the donate button over here. That would be great. And uh, we will see everyone again next time. And as they say, salute.